by the time that we are sufficiently modest to try factual solutions only, because other efforts escape our intellectual grip, we shall do our utmost best to avoid all those interfaces impairing our ability to factor the system in a helpful way. And I cannot but expect that this will repeatedly lead to the discovery that an initially untractable problem can be factored after all. Anyone who has seen how the majority of the troubles of the compiling phase called code generation can be tracked down to funny properties of the order code will know a simple example of the kind of thing I have in mind. The wider applicability of nicely factored solutions is my sixth and last argument for the technical feasibility of the revolution that might take place in the current decade. In principle, I leave it to you to decide for yourself how much weight you are going to give to my considerations, knowing only too well that I can force no one else to share my beliefs. As each serious revolution, it will provoke a violent opposition, and one can ask oneself where to expect the conservative forces trying to counteract such a development. I don't expect them primarily in big business, not even in the computer business. I expect them rather in the educational institutions that provide today's training and in those conservative groups of computer users that think their old programs so important that they don't think it worthwhile to rewrite and improve them. In this connection it is sad to observe that on many a university campus the choice of the central computing facility has too often been determined by the demands of a few established but expensive applications with a disregard to the question how many thousands of small users that are willing to write their own programs were going to suffer from this choice. Too often, for instance, high energy physics seem to have blackmailed the scientific community with the price of its remaining experimental equipment. The easiest answer, of course, is a flat denial of the technical feasibility. But I'm afraid that you need pretty strong arguments for that. No reassurance, alas, can be obtained from the remark that the intellectual ceiling of today's average programmer will prevent the revolution from taking place. With others programming so much more effectively, he is liable to be edged out of the picture anyway. There may also be political impediments. Even if we know how to educate tomorrow's professional programmer, it is not certain that the society we are living in will allow us to do so. The first effect of teaching a methodology, uh, rather than disseminating knowledge, is that of enhancing the capacities of the already capable, thus magnifying the difference in intelligence, in intellect. In a society in which the educational system is used as an instrument for the establishment of a homogenized culture, in which the cream is prevented from rising to the top, the education of competent programmers could be politically impalatable. Let me conclude. Automatic computers have now been with us for a quarter of a century. They have had a great impact on our society in their capacity of tools. But in that capacity, their influence will be but a ripple on the surface of our culture, compared with the much more profound influence they will have in their capacity of an intellectual 
challenge without precedent in the cultural history of mankind. Hierarchical systems seem to have the property that something considered as an undivided entity on one level is considered as a composite object on the next lower level of greater detail. As a result, the natural grain of space or time that is applicable at each level decreases by an order of magnitude when we shift our attention from one level to the next lower one. We understand walls in terms of bricks, bricks in terms of crystals, crystals in terms of molecules, etc. As a result, the number of levels that can be distinguished meaningfully in a hierarchical system is kind of proportional to the logarithm of the ratio between the largest and the smallest grain. And therefore, unless this ratio is very large, we cannot expect many levels. In computer programming, our basic building block has an associated time grain of less than a microsecond. But our program may take hours of computation time. I do not know of any other technology covering a ratio of 10 to the power 10 or more. The computer, by virtue of its fantastic speed, seems to be the first to provide us with an environment where highly hierarchical artifacts are both possible and necessary. This challenge, the confrontation with the programming task, is so unique that this novel experience can teach us a lot about ourselves. It should deepen our understanding of the processes of design and creation. It should give us better control over the task of organizing our thoughts. If it didn't do so, to my taste we shouldn't deserve the computer at all. It has already taught us a few lessons. And the one I've chosen to stress in this talk is the following. We shall do a much better programming job, provided that we approach the task with a full appreciation of its tremendous difficulty, provided that we stick to modest and elegant programming languages, provided that we restrict the intrinsic limitations of the human mind and approach the task as very humble programmers. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Dykstra. The Association for Computing Machinery and Information Cassettes, Incorporated, hope you've benefited from the ideas personally presented by the speaker. This copyrighted information cassette is one of many produced by Information Cassettes, Incorporated. <laughs>